Okay, we are coming back up alive. All right, we are live. We're back. I want to know if you're back. We had technical difficulties. Somebody suggested that uh, maybe we don't have enough bandwidth, which means that everybody else is on their computer this morning because they have nowhere to go. And it could mean that everybody else in the neighborhood is watching us. Okay, I see we've got uh, one back. Uh, check in again as you come back. I'm going to give us a minute or two, and then I'm going to continue on. We will be posting this on YouTube later today. So that, okay, there's Mike. He's back. Very good. We'll be on YouTube uh, with this later today, so you'll be able to see part one of the message and part two of the message. Okay, we got some more people back. Very good. All right. I am going to uh, hop in in just a moment. Don's back. We've got uh, eight people that are back. Great machines, anyway. Okay, Tara's back. Hey, Donnie. So I guess this is an important message because we've not crashed before. So here we go with the rest of it. So as you remember, the disciples, uh, Jesus in the boat, a huge storm. The disciples are doing everything they can to keep the boat from going under because the storm is so big. And we come to see uh, what Jesus is doing in the boat while they're all trying to keep the boat afloat. Jesus is sleeping. How in the world do you sleep in the midst of a superstorm? How in the world do you sleep with the waves crashing against the boat? How is Jesus sleeping? Is he a heavy sleeper? Is he really tired? Or is it because he's Jesus? Well, maybe, but I think there's something else going on here. But we'll come back to it. Hang on to why is Jesus able to sleep in the midst of the storm? The disciples are fighting this losing battle against the wind and the waves. Their ship is going to go under at any moment. They're all going to drown. There's only one thing left to do. They do it. They wake Jesus. It says right there, the disciples went and woke Jesus saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. Jesus wakes up, looks around, but before he gets up, before he does anything else, he asks the disciples a question. He asked the disciples a question. You of little faith, why are you so afraid? I picture Andrew holding on to the side of the boat for dear life, saying to Jesus, more likely yelling to Jesus through the storm, why are we afraid? Jesus, we're in the middle of a storm. Don't you see the waves? Don't you feel the rain in your face? Don't you feel the wind blowing? How can you say, why are you afraid? And at that moment, a 10 foot wave collapses on top of Andrew and nearly washes Andrew and two other disciples out of the boat. When Andrew recovers, he says, what kind of question was that anyway? How can we, how can you ask, why are you so afraid? And as Andrew finishes, a 15-foot wave rises up. It's going to smash the boat to smithereens. But before we get there, let's talk about fear for a moment. Why are we so afraid? Why does fear eat our lunch every single time? We get afraid when we lose control. We get afraid when there is a situation 
and we can't control it. We get afraid when we can't make things happen that we want to have happen. We get afraid when we can't stop things from happening that are happening. And the more important it is to us that those things happen or those things don't happen, the more afraid we get, and that being afraid builds fear within us. We lose power, we lose control, we become overcome with fear, we get afraid. This year, 60,000 or so people will die from the flu. But are we afraid of the flu? No. Why aren't we afraid of the flu? Well, we feel like we've got control of the flu. Been there, done that. I get the flu, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna take it easy for a couple of days and the flu will start to go away. If that doesn't work, I'll go down to the local drugstore and I'll load myself up with over-the-counter flu medications and they'll work. Or maybe I'll get grandma to make me a nice big crock of hot steaming chicken noodle soup. Or I'll take some other natural family recipe. If those don't work, I'll go to the doctor. He's got all kinds of medicines. That'll take care of it. And if what the doctor gives me doesn't work, I'll wind up in the hospital and they'll pump me full of IVs and all kinds of stuff. I'll be happy and soon I'll be well. Yeah, 60,000 people a year die of flu, but it's not going to happen to me. I got this. We got this. Nothing to be afraid of. It's only the flu. The coronavirus comes and we are told this is brand new. We've never seen it before. There is no cure for it. We don't know how to treat it. We don't know how to cure it. We don't know what it's going to do. We don't know how it acts. The coronavirus is 10 times more contagious than the flu, they tell us. We can't stop it from spreading. Control is taken away. We have no control over corona. We have no history with it. We're told that nothing we can do will cure it. Grandma's chicken noodle soup doesn't even make a dent in it. We're told that everyone's going to get it, that we can't prevent getting it. There is no control at all. Suddenly, we're afraid. And one fear leads to another, leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. We humans are control freaks. You take control away from us, and we freak! That's who we are. That's what we do. But Jesus tells us it's possible to have an untroubled heart. And Jesus himself is sleeping during the storm. Back with the boat, Jesus' question still stands, even though Andrew is soaked from a fresh wave and there's a huge wave that's about to hit them. His question still stands. Why are you so afraid? And Andrew would say, the storm. And we would say, the coronavirus and the social distancing and the economy and all the rest. But Jesus would say, no, I didn't ask, what were you afraid of? I asked, why? And Andrew would say, I don't care about the answer to that. Just take away the storm. And we say, I don't care about the answer to that. Just take away the virus and make life the way it was before. But Jesus' question stands. Why are we so afraid? And the answer to the question is found in the very first part of it. Oh, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? It's found in the first part, the answer. Oh, you have a little faith. Faith, faith, faith means trust. Faith means belief. Faith, trust, believe. Faith is about who do you turn to in the midst of the storm? Who do you turn to in the midst of the storm? Who do we collectively turn to in the midst of the storm? Most of us, when the storm comes, we turn to ourselves. We trust ourselves. We believe in ourselves. We got this. We can handle this. We know what to do. We take initiative. Uh, we're Americans and all the rest of that stuff. And if we can't solve the health storm on our own, or if we can't solve the economic storm on our own, we go to the doctor, we go to the hospital, we take medicines, that's where we turn. That's who we trust. 
in the economic storm, we, we turn to our boss, we turn to our small business, we turn to our corporation, we ask for a raise, we ask for help, we turn to financial experts, we turn to the stock market. That's who we turn. That's who we trust. The problem is where we turn and who we trust isn't able to handle the storms that come our way. Oh, we say, I got this. Or we say collectively, we got this. We got this. My doctor's got this. My financial advisor's got this. My company's got this. My team of experts have this. And in dire situations, we might even say the government's got this. But the truth is, we don't have it. Well, we got about this much of it, but we need to have this much more. Who do you turn to in the midst of the storm? I remember the storm. I was maybe four years old. The storm was in the middle of the night. It was a loud storm. The thunder rattled the windows in the bedroom, in the bedroom where I was sleeping. The thunder rattled my little rib cage. The rain, you could hear it on the roof. It pounded against the windows. It was a bright storm. The sky kept lighting up every couple of minutes and it lit up so brightly. It lit right through my curtains and lit up my dark room. It was bright, then it was dark, then it was bright, then it was dark and it was noisy, then it was quiet, then it was noisy and you could hear the rain. And there was this bolt of lightning that happened with a crack and an explosion of thunder all at the same time that jolted me out of bed. And who did I run to in the midst of the storm? I ran right into my parents' bedroom and up into the bed. If I could just get near dad if I could just be with my dad it would be okay and I got next to my dad with my dad and the storm is still raging but I was okay I was with my dad the whole house could have blown away but I was with my dad and it was okay who do we turn to in the midst of the storm Jesus is sleeping in the midst of the storm because he's not in a storm. He's in his father's arms. Jesus is sleeping in the midst of the storm because he knows that his father, our father in heaven, has got this. Jesus is sleeping in the midst of the storm because he knows that his father, our father in heaven, loves him. Jesus is sleeping in the midst of the storm because he knows that his father, our father, in heaven has his best interest at heart. Jesus is sleeping in the midst of the storm because he knows that his father, our father, is able to take anything that happens and make good come out of it. Jesus is sleeping in the midst of the storm because he knows that his father, our father, in heaven is right there with him. Jesus is sleeping in the midst of the storm because he knows he's not alone. Jesus is sleeping in the midst of the storm because he knows that his father, our father in heaven, has got him, has got his life, and it's going to be okay. He may not know how it's going to be okay, but he knows it's going to be okay because his father, our father in heaven, has this. And his father, our father in heaven, is far bigger, far more powerful than the storm. The disciples are freaked in the midst of the storm because they don't know. They don't believe, they don't trust that our Father in heaven has this storm. They don't know, they don't believe, they don't trust that our Father in heaven loves them. They don't know, they don't believe, they don't trust that our Father in heaven has their best interest at heart. They don't know, they don't believe that our Father in heaven is going to take care of them. They don't know, they don't believe that our Father in heaven is right there with them in the midst of the boat. They believe that they're alone and that God is nowhere to be seen and can't be turned to and can't be trusted, and so they are afraid. Who do we turn to in the midst of the storm? Who do we trust? Jesus says it's possible 
for us to have such trust in God that in the midst of the storm, we can sleep alongside with him, knowing that our Father God has us and has the storm. So let me ask a question. How? How did Jesus know this about God? Well, Jesus knew this about God because he spent time with God. Well, not a little bit here, not five minutes there, not running the car here, not 911 prayers, but time with God. Jesus spent extended amounts of time with God. We're always reading about Jesus leaving the crowds. He's leaving the crowds to go up into the hills to pray. He's sending away the crowd to go up to the mountain to pray. He's sending away the disciples so they can go pray. He sends the disciples to the other side of the lake so they can go pray. He leaves the miracles so they can go pray. He spends extended periods of time with God in prayer. And part of what he's doing in those extended periods of time is not only talking with God about what's going on, but being still before God, listening to God, letting God love him, letting God imprint God's nature and character in his life so that Jesus knows here in his heart and here in his head that his Father in heaven is with him, loves him, and has got whatever it is that life brings his direction. Catch up to my slides. So if Jesus needs to spend time with God in order to be calm in the midst of the storm, what about you and me? I mean, if Jesus, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Son of God has to spend time with God in order to be calm, how much more so do we need to spend time with God in order to be calm in the midst of the storm? Now, if I were to spend time with God, if I were to spend extended periods of time with God, what would I do? Well, what are the things that cause you to feel loved by God that cause you to feel close to God? Some people feel God's love and God's presence when they go walk in the woods. If you feel God's love and God's presence when you walk in the woods, go walk in the woods. Walk in the woods a lot. If you feel God's presence and God's love uh, when you play uh, praise and worship music and you sing along, then play the music and sing along a lot. If you feel God's presence as a result of sitting in a room all by yourself where there's nobody else around and nothing to disturb you where you can focus on God, then go sit in the room and be alone with God. Do it a lot. If you feel God's presence in your love and your life as a result of helping someone, then go help a bunch of people. I know that we're socially distanced, but you can still find ways to help people. If you feel God's presence and God's love as a result of reading the Bible or reading other Christian authors, then read. Read a lot. Do those things that put us in God's presence and cause us to feel loved by God. Someone mentioned to me, you know, with social distancing and I'm working less hours or I'm not working at all, I got time on my hands and I'm not quite sure what to do. Well, spend some of it with God. And as we're spending time with God, I want to share with you four faith-building passages of Scripture for us to hone in on and to read and work through every day. Here they are. The first one is Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside still waters. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I want. Read that and don't just read it. Read it slowly and don't just read it. Pray it. Jesus be my shepherd. Jesus, please supply my needs, my wants. Jesus, please make me lay down in green pastures. Jesus, please lead me beside still waters. Jesus, please lead me in paths of righteousness. Or say thank you with the prayer. Jesus, thank you for being my shepherd. Jesus, thank you for supplying my wants and my needs. And make a list. Thank you that I've got groceries. Thank you that I've got toilet paper in the house. Thank you that I've got money to pay the bills. Thank you that I've got a roof over my head. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for supplying. Thank you for leading me beside still waters. Thank you for restoring my soul. 
It's the 23rd Psalm. Get into it. Read it. Pray it. Second passage to get into and to have it get into our heads, into our hearts, are the words of Jesus found in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. This is the passage where Jesus says, why are you worried about what you eat, about what you drink, about what you will wear, about what you will live? Isn't life more important than that? And Jesus continues on and closes that passage saying, your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. Which is to say, he's going to take care of that. He's going to provide for that. We don't have to worry about those things. What Jesus wants us to do instead is to seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. And as we do that, as we seek God's face, as we seek God's kingdom, as we seek God's righteousness, God is going to give us all the stuff that we need. He'll make sure there's a roof over our heads. He'll make sure the bills are paid. He'll make sure there's uh, groceries on the table, toilet paper, uh, in the bathroom, he'll take care of all that. And our job is to seek first the kingdom, to seek first God. So read the passage, read it slowly, pray the passage. God, I'm worried about what I'm gonna eat. Please take care of what I'm gonna eat. I'm worried about how I'm gonna pay the rent. Please take care of how I'm gonna pay the rent. God, please help me to seek your face. Please help me to seek your face. Please help me to focus. Every day, get into that passage. Third passage is from Romans chapter 8, uh, beginning with verse 28, going to verse uh, 39. This passage begins with, in all things, God works together for good for those who love him. In all things, God works together. God works everything for good for those who love him. God works everything for good for those who love him. God works everything for good for those who love him. God works the coronavirus for good for those who love him. God works social distancing for good for those who love him. God works economic shortfalls for good for those who love him. God works uh, financial hardships for good for those who love him. God works uh, disease and illness and sickness for good for those who love him. God works uh, relational difficulties, marriage problems, family issues for good for those who love him. God works all things for good for those who love him. And get into that verse, read it and pray it out. All the things that you're worried about, all the things that you're concerned about, all the bad stuff that's going on. List it. God works that item and that item and that item and that item for good in your life. Can you see what the good is right now? Maybe not, but God is working it for good. And the passage ends with, and there is nothing in all creation that is able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The coronavirus can't separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Social distancing can't separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Economic difficulty can't separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, health difficulties can't separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Relational difficulties can't separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And read the passage. Pray the passage. Dig into the passage and put your situation into the passage. Just do that daily. The last passage is uh, 1 John uh, chapter 4, verse 4. And there John writes, Dear children, you have overcome the spirits of the world. Why? Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. What are the spirits of the world that we have overcome? Well, right now it sounds like this. The sky is falling, we're all gonna die. We have overcome that because greater is he who is in us than the fear that is in the world. Who is the he that is in us? God the Father, the creator of the heavens and the earth has made his dwelling place in our hearts. Jesus Christ, 
the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the one who died on the cross to bring us forgiveness and to bring his Holy Spirit and to make us into the dwelling place of God has come to dwell in our hearts. The Holy Spirit, the very presence of God, the very power of God in our lives to change our hearts and to make a difference in the world around us and to use us to make that difference dwells in our hearts. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is stronger than anything or anyone or any spirit that is in the world out there. The one who is in us is stronger than the one who is in us is stronger than social distancing. The one who is in us is stronger than economic hardship. The one who is in us is stronger than, and you fill in the blank. Now, it's impossible to read those passages and work through them the way that I've just worked through them and still be afraid. As we work through those passages, we discover that God is with us, that God loves us, that God cares about us, that God can be counted upon, that God can be trusted. Oh, even though everyone's still afraid, and even though the virus is still out there, and even though the economy hasn't been opened back up yet, God's got us. And as long as we're with him, we'll be all right. We're going to get through this. We're going to be okay. We're going to be all right. We might even grow. And the reason I know this is the one who lives within me is greater than the one who is causing all the trouble out there. What I want you to be able to do is to crawl up into God's arms like a two or a three or a four year old will crawl up into their father's arms and be safe and be comforted and be at peace. Because when we get at peace in here, we can deal with all the stuff that's out there. We're going to pray in a minute, but I want you to know that next week we're going to talk about our thoughts and our self-talk and how they get us off track and how we can get back on track with our thoughts and our self-talk so that we can have untroubled hearts through this storm. God is with us. He knows you. He loves you. He's got you. It's going to be okay. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that you have us and that you've got this. In these moments of silence, I ask that your peace and your presence would wash over all of us who are gathered here today. And Father, if there is someone here who uh, doesn't have you on the inside, that never invited Jesus to come in, uh, I invite them to pray along with me this little prayer. Jesus, Please come into my heart. Please forgive me all the stuff that I've messed up. Please send your Holy Spirit to help me live different. And as you pray that prayer, there is forgiveness. <clears throat> your stuff is paid for. You're set free from it. And the love and the grace and the peace and the mercy and the favor and the presence of God moves into your heart. And you can be at peace. Thank you, Father, for your peace and for helping us to turn to you in the midst of the storm. Thank you for untroubled hearts. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Oh, take a breath. We prayed. Jose is going to pass the offering baskets. Uh, you still out there, Jose? Uh, so Jose's passing the offering baskets. And if you don't see Jose come by you with an offering basket, uh, you can give online.
Go to paradisecoastchurch.org, look for the giving tab, and you'll find directions there. Thank you for those of you who have been giving that way. Uh, we've been receiving your gifts. That function works. And if you're not comfortable giving electronically, you can send a, an offering to us in the mail. Uh, mail your check or whatever to 981 Hampton Circle, Naples, Florida, 34105. If you're in Canada or the Philippines, you can mail it to 981 Hampton Circle, Naples, Florida, 3105. Uh, my email address is there. So you got all that information. A couple of announcements for us on Wednesday. Wednesday at 7 p.m., I will be on Zoom. I have posted a Zoom link on Facebook. I have sent a Zoom invitation to a couple of you that I know. We're going to have a Zoom group, and our Zoom group is Untroubled Hearts. What we're going to do at our Zoom group from 7 to uh, 8.15, 8.30, is we're going to take a look at uh, some of the things that I talked about this morning. We're going to take a look at how are you dealing with the fear? What passages of Scripture do you use? How do these passages of Scripture help you? What insights do you have? How can we help each other deal with the fear? And we're going to pray for each other. So Zoom meeting on Troubled Hearts, Wednesday night, 7 p.m. We'll do this for the next four weeks as we work through the Untroubled Hearts series. Hope to see you there. If you want personal invite to it and the link and all of that, uh, message me, uh, send me an email and I'll get it out to you. Like I say, it's on the uh, Paradise Coast Church Facebook page. Uh, other announcement, I got a study going Wednesday morning in the book of Acts. We're in uh, Acts chapter nine. Uh, there's a Zoom link on the Facebook page for that. That's 7 a.m. Einstein, I'm sorry, 8 a.m. Einstein Bagel Study is what that one's called. I will be investigating uh, why we crashed in the middle of the service week this week, and hopefully we can uh, take whatever remedy is needed. Uh, also, uh, next week we'll have a different look. I've gotten some new software. I've got it about halfway learned week. I'll learn the other half of it. Uh, I think we'll be able to have some music and do some other stuff. So that's coming. Benediction. Oh, but before the benediction, I have a question. Was God in the house? If God was in the house, give me a like, uh, send me a, a comment saying that God was in the house. And if God was in the house, if God was in your house, speaking to you through this message. Uh, invite someone to tune in with you next week. Maybe invite them to your place, have them sit six feet away from you, or tell them how they can connect up with this on their very own uh, phone or laptop or tablet or other mobile device. Benediction. May the love of God, the grace and peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you and be with you now and always. Amen. Amen. Okay, thank you for tuning in. I told you that we would have Gail make an appearance at the end of the service. So, Gail, come on around here and say hello to all of those of you who wanted to see Gail. Here she comes. Three, two, one. There she is. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for tuning in. Best I can tell, there are between somewhere 45 to 50 of you today. Cool. Um, I'm not sure how many made it back exactly. Um, but thank you all for coming. All right. You can go back where you were and help me uh, scroll through the comments. Uh, okay. Got Mike back. Don's back. Tara. Pastor Dan's back. Bruce back. Patty's back. We don't give up easy. Good. Yeah, this will be posted on, uh, on YouTube later. 
Amen, Bonnie. Don't having faith. Amen from the Philippines. Amen from Tara. Amen from Bonnie. Lots of hope. Kit, God was in the house. All right. Oh, Michael says, hi, Gail. Bonnie says, hi. Kit says, hi. Sharon, it's good to have you with us. He was in the house. All right. Okay, well, I am going to sign off. Look forward to being with you next week. Uh, connect with you on Wednesday. And God bless you and have untroubled hearts.